Well, good morning, South Park Church. Come on, we're in the Father's house this morning. Will you stand with me and sing? Come on, we're going to lay our burdens down. We sing sometimes. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. It looks to me like failure is a canvas for strength. My story isn't over, so my story isn't good. Failure's never final. Never final, cause that's what my father does. Ooh, lay your burdens down. Oh, oh, here in the father's house. Check your shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, ooh. it'll be in the Father's house. Come on. Come on, we sing Arrival's not the end game. Arrival's not the end game. The journey's where you are. Wanted perfect, just wanted my heart. And the story isn't over if the story isn't good. Failure's never final when the Father's in the room. Failure's never final when the Father's in the room. Come on. Shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, ooh, you'll be in the Father's house, yeah. Come on, we sing the prodigals are coming home. All of us will find hope. Come on, that's what happens when love is in the room. We sing together. Prodigals come home, the helpless find hope. Love is on the move when the Father's in the room. Prison doors fling wide, the dead come to life. Love is on the move when the Father's in the Come on. Miracles take place, the cynical find faith. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Tyrannical walls are quaking, strongholds now are shaking. Love's breaking through when the Father's in the room. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Oh, oh, lay your burdens down. Oh, oh, here in the Father's house, check your shame. Come on, we're going to teach you guys a new song this morning. It's all about getting lost in his presence, getting lost in his love. Come on, it's a great place to be in the presence of our Father's love. In the morning, when the evening comes, you put this song in my heart. If I'm rich or completely poor, I keep your song in my heart. Who oh, the joy it is to know you, I mean really, really know you. 
And I know you're thinking of me always What a joy it is to love you I may really, really love you You're the song of all my moments and my days You sing, I want I want to get lost in your love I want to get lost in your perfect praise It's I'm going to sing and I'm going to dance You've taken the shackles off my head I'm able to praise you So I'm going to praise you You are moving in the little things you work it all for my good. Come on, believe that. You're my father, you're my closest friend. You work it all for my good. What a joy it is to know you. I mean, really, really know you And to know you're always thinking of me What a joy it is to love you I mean, really, really love you You're the song of all my moments and my days We sing, I want to get lost I want to get lost in you I'm gonna sing and I'm gonna dance I'm taking the shackles off my head I'm able to praise you So I'm gonna praise you I wanna get lost in your love I wanna get lost in your perfect praise And I'm gonna sing I've been a dead, you've taken the shackles off my head. I'm able to praise you, so I'm gonna praise you. I'm able to praise you, so I'm gonna praise you, and I can't contain. Shepherd boy knows fit for a king. So if I'm made to sing and worship, and that's all I'm gonna do, you are the song of all my moments and my days. I wanna get lost in your love. I wanna get lost. In your perfect, I'm gonna sing and I'm gonna dance, taking the shackles off my head. I'm able to praise you, so I'm gonna praise you. I'm gonna get lost in your love, Jesus. Oh, I wanna get lost in your perfect. Hey! 
Good morning, South Park Church. You can go ahead and be seated. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, if you're new or returning, uh, it's great to have you with us this morning. And for our first-time guests, an extra special welcome uh, to you. Uh, thank you for choosing to worship with us today. You are in the right place. Uh, and for those of you joining us online, it's great to have you joining us as well this morning. Uh, if you want to learn more about our church and some different events and things that we have uh, going on, you can do that on our website. And you just go on there and uh, find all kinds of different groups and things going on. Uh, you can also sign up for our e-newsletter. So if you want to learn more about uh, those events and get up-to-date information on what is happening in the life of the church, uh, the e-newsletter is a great uh, place to start. It goes out every Wednesday. And at the bottom of the e-newsletter, there's also prayer requests. So if you are interested in uh, sharing prayer requests, uh, we're a church that believes in praying together. Uh, it's a huge, important part of who we are. Uh, so if you are interested in praying for others or you want to request prayer for yourself, uh, you can do that on our website, and you can also do that in person here. So uh, if you want to go out to the, the double doors there sometime after service, there's cards out there. You can just fill them out. Uh, your prayer request can be anonymous. You can put your name on it. Whatever you want to do, whatever you're comfortable doing, we would just love the opportunity to pray for you. And, of course, if you want to find one of us in person, we'd love to pray with you in person too. Uh, we're also a church that believes in generosity, and if you are interested in giving to the church. You can do that on the website as well. You can do it in person. There's a, a drop box right over there if you're interested in doing that. But of course, it's not just about money, right? It's about service. It's about uh, giving our lives to God and serving Him. So you can also do that uh, with your time, with your talents, with your energy. Uh, and we love to be a church that has lots of groups uh, that get together and walk through life together. And there's lots of opportunities for that actually coming up. Uh, and also after the service, uh, we'd love to get together with you in the crossroads space that is on the second floor. We have coffee, we have donuts. If you like coffee and donuts, that's a great place to go. And if you like fellowship and uh, getting the chance to meet some other people in the church to uh, just talk together and be together, uh, that's going to be right after this service on the second floor. Uh, we also have a, some things coming up with Easter coming. Uh, we have Ash Wednesday service, which will be on Wednesday if that wasn't already clear. And uh, that will be coming up. At 7 p.m., that'll be right in this space in the modern sanctuary here. Uh, so if you would like to join for that service, we would love to have you for that. And we have lots of study groups coming up as well. Uh, these study groups are different opportunities for us to learn together, uh, to worship together, and to get to know each other even better uh, than just during this hour of service here. Uh, so there's a couple opportunities. There's sign-ups that are right outside the door there on uh, sheets of paper. You can also sign up on the website if you're interested. Uh, and just to kind of give you an idea of what these study groups will look like, uh, the first one is called Be the Bridge. Uh, that's going to be something where uh, it's really about racial justice and conversations about that. If you're interested in joining in that conversation uh, together, uh, there's an opportunity for that. And that is going to be uh, Sundays at 1130 from March 6th to April 10th. And that will be right in this space here. Uh, the next class, the next study group, is a lectionary gathering. So they'll be going through the lectionary, which will include uh, scriptures, it will include prayers, it will include music, uh, going through that uh, for the season of Lent. And that one will be Thursdays at 7 p.m., March 3rd to April 7th. So if you're interested in that one, that will be uh, up here as well in the same space. And then the last one that you can sign up for is called Walking the Path that will be going through uh, the story of Jesus before the crucifixion and going through that season of Lent and looking at his words, looking at his actions and studying that together and learning from that and what Jesus' life can teach us about how we are supposed to live uh, in him. So if you're interested in joining that one, that will be uh, Mondays at 7 p.m. And again, that will be starting uh, right up here uh, soon. So those are a couple opportunities that you have if you're interested in joining any of these study groups. We would love to have you join those. Uh, now, moving forward, we also have a sermon series that we have been continuing. It's called Happy. And it's really looking at what does the Bible have to say about how to be happy and what that means to be happy. But also, what does science have to say about happiness and, and how to be happy, which I think is a very important thing uh, based upon what is happening in our world. Right There is... A lot of things going on, which is causing stress and anxiety and fear and panic 
and it can be a really difficult thing to understand how exactly to be happy, especially with all of these things going on. Uh, so what we're going to do is kind of go through that, that sermon series and look at that concept and what the Bible has to teach us about it. So at this time, we're going to continue our service in worship. I'd like to invite you all to stand as we continue this. Uh, and to keep in mind that as we worship, with all the stress and all the anxiety and all the worries of the past week, just set it aside. And all the stress and all the worries and the anxiety of the week to come, and set it aside and just be present in this moment. And let's worship God together. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my savior of that cursed tree His body bound in drenched in tears He laid him down in Joseph's tomb He entered sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone We sing oh praise Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. break of dawn, the sun of heaven rose again, oh trample death, where is your sting, the angels roar, for Christ the King, oh. Shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face.
amen, amen. Church, you may take a seat and take a look at the screens. everybody. Um, I want to say a welcome to everyone who is joining us now on the modern, in the modern service on the fourth floor and everyone who is joining us online as well. Um, it's good to, to be with you as well. Um, so I don't know about you, but I have spent some time online this week. I spend time online most weeks. Um, but this week I spent some time looking for things, and I sometimes do this, where I was just looking for some feel-good stories. You know what I mean by like a feel-good story? Just like a story that just, like it, it's like, oh, well, that's a nice thing. There's nice things going on. And, and I ran across um, this story that is not a new story to me. You may have seen it as well. Uh, but I love stories kind of like this. And, and this story is um, one between two people who didn't know each other. And um, they had this interaction, this kind of text exchange that happened. Um, so there was a guy named Jamal and then um, a woman named Wanda. And Jamal was a 17-year-old kid, and he got a text from a number that he didn't know, inviting him to Thanksgiving dinner. And so he responded asking, you know, who is this? Um, and the response was, your grandma. And he said, will you send me a picture? <laughs> and, and so she, she sent him a picture. Sure, um, of her, and there she is, and and he said, "Grandma?" Question <laughs> mark. Like, not my grandma. You're not my grandma. And um, then he sent a picture of himself, and and um, and you know confirmed like, "Oh, actually, you're not my grandma." And then he he like sent a laughing emoji, and he said, "Well, can I still get a plate though?" And and she said, "Yes, of course. That's what grandmas do. We feed everybody." And so he came, he came to Thanksgiving dinner, and this was in 2016, and he has come to Thanksgiving dinner every single year since 2016. And I have seen this on a lot of um, years, actually. It's, it's not a new story to me. But stories like this remind us that there are good things happening just in kind of corners all around the world, right? Where, where people are doing acts of kindness and that there is goodness that's happening. Um, you know, today we are finishing a sermon series about happiness, and uh, we've been when looking at that over the last number of weeks, and I think part of what inspired this whole sermon series was just recognizing that the past couple of years especially, there have been a lot of hard emotions, and there's been a lot of languishing, and, um, and so we've been looking at happiness, and we've been looking at theology, and uh, we've been looking at the science of happiness. Um, and you know, what this sermon today and what this series is not is really saying that we just all need to be happy all the time or that we should be happy all the time or that if you would just kind of do better that everything would be okay, right? This, that is not what this, these messages are about, not just to try harder. Uh, but there's a guy named Gary Hagan and he's the founder and CEO of uh, International Justice Mission. I don't know if you know that organization. It's um, a, a Christian group that works to free people who are enslaved around the world. And he has this quote that I've been thinking about. And he says, um, he said, joy is the oxygen to do hard things. And so I've been thinking about that a lot this week, about how joy or happiness can be the oxygen for us to do hard things. And I've been thinking about that this week in part because there are a lot of hard things that are going on. Right? There, there are bombs going off in the Ukraine right now. And so, you know, we might ask the question, is it appropriate for us to come and talk about happiness when there are so many big things that are going on and so many hard things that are going on in people's lives and around the world? And, you know, the thing is, as we are talking about happiness, we are not looking for a way to avoid the hard things. 
right? I think it would be inappropriate for us to do that. If the message was just try harder and do better or don't look at those things, that would be hard, right? But actually, what we're doing is we are not looking away for, from hard things. We are recognizing that right in the middle of our really hard, sometimes broken and messy, beautiful, full, tragic lives, that we are on the hunt for meaning and we are on the hunt for fulfillment and even happiness because it is this happiness and these joy that sometimes fuel like all of the stuff, right? It's the oxygen for us to do hard things, hard things like being human in this world where we live. And so we're not looking to avoid anything. Um, we are going to continue that today and uh, we are going to be looking at happiness and we're gonna be finishing this series. And in doing that, we've been relying a lot on a woman named Lori Santos. Um, and she is uh, a professor at Yale University and she uh, teaches the psychology of a good life. And she's turned this really popular course into um, a, actually a podcast you can listen to called The Happiness Lab. And so she's done a lot of research on the science of happiness. And so we've been looking at that over the last number of weeks, and we're going to continue doing that um, today. But today, as we consider happiness, what I, what I want us to, to think about specifically is kindness or acts of kindness. So Lori talks about this in her research, and this is also something that shows up in Scripture. And so we are going to be um, looking at that. And, you know, I mentioned that as I was thinking and preparing for today, I really did wrestle with this idea of, of happiness and how that fits with all of the stuff that's going on in the world, right? And thinking about like, gosh, you know, there are some really cool and beautiful stories like the text message exchange that, you know, that I mentioned and all of these things that are going on um, in corners of the world all over. But then there are also just some really hard things that are going on in our own lives, things that we're really wrestling with, you know, diagnoses and illnesses and death. And then there's all this stuff that's going on in the world, right? The, the, the war that's going on with, with Russia and Ukraine. And then I was reading the news and I was reading about, you know, stuff in our own country, some of the laws that were passed in Texas about transgendered kids. And I was reading in our own city about some of the stuff down in Ballantyne. And there were all these debates. I was reading this article about whether they should have more dense housing. And then I was reading stuff about masks and whether, you know, they should be optional and should our kids wear them in schools. You know, all these things that stir up emotions in us where we have these really strong ideas about what we think about all of this stuff, right? And then there are these issues that deal with justice and, and vulnerable people. And, and I was asking this question, I was like, you know, gosh, I mean, do we maybe need to, to be less kind? Like, do we need to be like more forward, like marching and, you know, like, hey, I don't know. And just asking this question, like, why are we talking about kindness when people are dying? What is this that we're doing? And more fundamentally, does it really matter if we're kind? Does it really matter if we do these things to be kind to each other, right? To let somebody in front of you in the grocery store line or something. Does it really matter if we're kind? And I think it turns out that it does matter. It does matter if we're kind. And so that's true not only based on what the Bible teaches, but on science as well. Um, but we are going to start... Uh, by reading together a story about an act of kindness that's found in the Bible. And this is about the life of David, um, King David. He's one of the most compelling characters in the Hebrew Bible. So David was the one who, when he was young, was anointed to be king. And at the time, there was a different king, Saul, um, who was on the throne. And King Saul had a son named Jonathan. And through a series of events, Jonathan and David um, became very well... Um, became very good friends. And so as they were friends, um, they grew really close. And David, as a result of that, actually made a promise to Jonathan that he was going to take care of his family. And so the, our, the story where we're going to pick up, fast forward from that, and we're now at the point in David's life where actually Saul and Jonathan had both been killed in battle. 
um, and David was on the throne, so he was the king. And we're going to start reading together from 2 Samuel in chapter 9. And David asked, Is there anyone left of the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Ziba said to the king, There remains a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. The king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, He is in the house of Machir, son of Amil, at Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, son of Amil, at Lodabar. Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and did obeisance, which is to kind of like curtsy or bow, like to show reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, I am your servant. David said to him, do not be afraid, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land of your grandfather, Saul, and you yourself shall eat at my table always. Okay, so David is king, and what's happening here is he's saying, hey, listen, I made this promise to my good friend, Jonathan, that I would take care of his, his family. Is there anyone still alive, not just from Jonathan's family, but from anyone in Saul's family? And they said, there is this guy, Mephibosheth. And so he sends for Mephibosheth and finds out that he is now a grown man, and he's married, and he has a son, and he's crippled. And so David calls and has him brought to him. Now, Mephibosheth lives in Lodabar. And Lodabar, the name actually means kind of no place. Debar means like word or pasture, thing, place. But lo means it's a prefix for no. So this town, they often named things to be descriptive of their towns. And so if that's true of this place, this is a place of, of no pasture. Right? So it would be a place where, where they couldn't have many animals. Um, it would be a place of, of no thing, no significance. Right? So this would be a place that's essentially nothing town. Right? In English today, we might say, like, it's just a little town in the middle of nowhere. Right? It's just a small place that maybe doesn't have a lot of significance. And so this is where Mephibosheth is living. And he went from being the grandson of the king um, to now being a man who is crippled and living in a self-imposed exile in the middle of nowhere. And then the king calls for him. And the first thing that King David says to him is don't be afraid. Now he would have had really good reasons to be afraid to be called before the king. Because in that time, if you were a new king, you would really get rid of anyone who was in the family of the old king who you had replaced. Right, because Mephibosheth would have had a claim through blood to the throne based on some other people and, and what they would have thought, right? And so he said to him, don't, don't be afraid, right? I've called you here not to kill you, but to be kind to you, right? I'm not here to wage war. I'm here, I'm calling you here so that I can wage kindness. That was what the summons was to come here. And that's exactly what he did. He gave him all of the land that was Saul's. And then he put 35 men under him to be his servants, to work the land and to serve him and his family. And then he said, you get to eat at my table, right? So he was invited to sit at the table of the king as if he were still the son of the king. Now, there is a lot that we can learn from this story, right? But kind of just glaring at us right from the start is the reality that David has lost his connection to this family. Right, Jonathan was his best friend, and this was his son, and he didn't even know that he was alive. So he had lost an important connection in his life. And so this act of kindness that David showed was a movement to restore and to build relationships. Right, is kindness important? Is it necessary? Well, one of the reasons that acts of kindness and doing stuff matter so much and why it's so important is that an act of kindness moves us in the direction of connection, right? It moves us towards each other. Kate Bowler, who is a professor at um, Duke Divinity, and she's an author that I like and I look up to a lot, when she talks about um, people, when she talks about faith stuff, a lot of times she talks about us in terms of being a group project, right? And, and the Bible has language like the body and, you know, things. But, but really just this idea of interconnectedness, 
that we were created for connection. We were created to be together with each other, interacting with one another. And so these acts of kindness, they move us towards each other, right? So whether you're dropping off a meal for a family that you know, or you're paying for somebody's lunch, you know, at the fast food restaurant that you don't know, or you're sending money to a family in the Ukraine, like all of these actions are things that move us towards each other. These are things that are moving us to be interconnected, whether we know each other or we don't. Acts of kindness move us towards connection, right? And this, this does matter, right? Especially when things are hard. And acts of kindness are also really important because um, acts of kindness really demonstrate God's character. So I was looking up the word kindness in different Bible dictionaries, and um, one of the definitions I came across I really liked, it said, kindness is an attribute of God and a quality that's desirable but not very consistently found in humans. <laughs> and I thought, well, isn't that the truth? <laughs> and, um, you know, but I, I thought, gosh, you know, it is true when we just start from the place of recognizing that kindness is an attribute of God that we see the kindness of God throughout scripture, all the way from the very beginning to the end, right? The kindness of God in delivering the Israelites, the kindness of God throughout all of Jesus's ministry, right? All of the miracles of kindness that Jesus showed when he was moved with kindness or compassion on people's behalf. And the kindness that God shows, it's, it's pretty remarkable in that he shows kindness to people who don't deserve it, that God shows kindness to people who, who definitely don't love him and have no intention of loving or serving him, right? That God shows this, this kindness to vulnerable people, to people who can't or won't respond with any kind of reciprocity. It is God's kindness that leads us to repentance. It's the kindness of God that shows up again and again in scripture. And so it's really noteworthy for us to look at this story of King David showing these remarkable acts of kindness to Mephibosheth and to recognize that he is reflecting something about the uh, character of God to the people who are around him, right? Because Mephibosheth was vulnerable. Right, I, I already mentioned that, that he, was, um, he was a crippled man living in the middle of nowhere, right? So he didn't really have anything to offer the king. It's not like King David would be like, ooh, I can get something by befriending him, right? And, and his bloodline actually would have made him a perceived threat. Um, and so I was thinking, like, can you imagine being one of the advisors to King David when he's thinking about doing this? And you'd just be like, listen. <laughs> I have some real reservations here. Uh, this could be a genuine threat to you because if you bring him in, you're essentially guaranteeing his family line is going to continue. And so you gotta think about your own family, you gotta think about your leadership, you gotta think about your kingdom, you know? I'm just thinking, how would I advise someone? Like, does this seem like a really great idea? Right, this is something that would potentially um, have a lot of personal cost to David if it didn't go well. And, and I think it's really cool because one thing that is often said of David uh, that's later in scriptures is that David was a man who was after God's own heart, is how people phrase it, right? He, there was something about David and his life and his character that people understood that his posture before the Lord was one where he, where he loved God and was trying to reflect God to the world around him. And so here you have David doing this remarkable thing, this showing kindness to someone who was vulnerable at the like potential extreme personal cost. And isn't that the picture of God? When I think about us, you and me, I think, you know, it really does matter if we show kindness in our interactions, in part because it demonstrates how well we understand God's kindness to us. Now we're living in a different um, time and under a different covenant than David. So I also wanna take us to a scripture that's found in the New Testament um, for us to read something about kindness there. So um, 
we're going to be reading from Galatians, and this is a letter that Paul wrote to a group of Christians, followers of Jesus, and he was reminding them what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. Um, and you know, I don't know if you all have decided to follow Jesus, right? Whether you're here in the room, you're upstairs, you're joining us online, this is something that is really just a fundamental question that we all have to wrestle with on our own. Right? Where we have to decide what we believe about Jesus. Is he really who he said he is? Right? This is our question that we're asking. Did Jesus really predict his own death and resurrection and then pull it off? And if he did, then in the words of Andy Stanley, game on. Right? Like if Jesus actually did, if he really is the Lord, if he actually predicted his own death and resurrection and then did it, then this is a guy worth following. And Paul was writing to a group of Christians who had already decided, yeah, I'm convinced. Yes, Jesus really is who he said he is. He really is the Lord. And this is what you and I are deciding. This is what you and I are wrestling with, right? When we're deciding, is Jesus really who he said he is? And if he is, game on. I'm in. And Paul is saying, if you're in, this is what it looks like. Right? This is what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. And then he goes on to explain to them that being a follower of Jesus, and he says this in so many different places, it doesn't, there is not a list of rules. There is not an in and an out. We don't follow the law anymore. When you're a follower of Jesus, you live by the Spirit. This is what he's telling them. Live by the Spirit. Keep in step with the Spirit. And then he was explaining to them, right, a little bit about what that means, that there is, there is a result from that, there is an effect that develops from that, and he calls it fruit. And so this is the verse that we're going to read. You may be familiar with it. It comes from Galatians 5, verse 22. And he says, by contrast, he had been talking about things that were not of God right before that, and so he's contrasting this. So he says, by contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. So Paul is, is instructing people to be guided by the Spirit, right? Here is something that is remarkable, is that when we are followers of Jesus, somehow, miraculously and mysteriously, we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Paul describes this as us being in Christ and Christ in us, right? There, there is this mystery around it. But somehow, amazingly, we actually become carriers of the presence of God that where we go, the presence of God goes with us, that the Holy Spirit actually indwells within us, lives with us. And we then, as followers of Jesus, are trying to live our life in a way that we are keeping in step with the Spirit of God who is always with us, right? So that means that what we're trying to do is to develop an attentiveness to the Spirit who is always in us. And so we're leaning in and we're listening and we're trying to pay attention to what the Holy Spirit is saying and doing within us as we go about our lives, right? And so, so this means like that, that we are, um, you know, when, when we're just going through our normal life and we're interacting and we're just like, gosh, you know, I'm really stressed out about this situation at work, right? The questions that we're asking is, Lord, what are you doing here? How are you at work? How can I join you in this? Right? If we have a conflict in our relationships, right, with our kids or our parents or our siblings or our coworkers, right, it's like what, what we're doing in that moment or what we can do to be attentive to the Holy Spirit is, Lord, what are you doing here in me? What are you saying to me about me in this situation? How are you growing me here? Right? Not what can I say to get back at them? How can I, you know, no, no, no. Holy Spirit, what are you doing in me? What fruit are you growing in my life? How, you know, how would you have me respond? And the fruit of that is the fruit of the Spirit that we just read, right? This is what starts to grow, what starts to develop, and what we start to see in each other. 
And one of the things that Paul lists as a fruit of the Spirit of God living in our lives is kindness. It's kindness. You know, I don't always remember to pay attention to the Holy Spirit, um, but sometimes I do. And there was this one day where I was um, at the checkout line, and I had a cashier who I think wasn't having her best day ever. And so I kind of just wanted to get on my phone and, you know, just kind of move on to the next thing in my day. Uh, but they had these little candies that are some of my kids' favorites, and so I, I put them on the belt because I decided I was going to buy them. And, you know, she kind of looked at me, and I was like, oh, those are my kids' favorite. And she said, oh, I've never tried those. And I just kind of had this little pause, you know, just this, hmm. And so I picked up another one, and I said, well, scan this one too. I'll buy it for you, and you can try it. Maybe you'll love it. And she just, like, stopped and was like, I don't know. It was, it was a real moment. Like, it ended up being this really remarkable, very simple, beautiful moment where instead of ignoring her or instead of saying something like, rude, which I'm very capable of, um, I, you know, I mean, our, I think we probably all are, but I, you know, I could have just grabbed my bags and been just like, all right, see ya, right? I, I was like, Lord, what are you doing? And we had this really cool moment where for like 50 cents, like the presence of God was there with us, right? Like how remarkable is that? And the thing is, she's probably forgotten about that, right? But I haven't. This happened about a year ago now. And I still think about that. And part of the reason that I think that I think about that is I'm just, I was amazed and how I felt at recognizing the work of the Holy Spirit and the way that we can pay attention and how it can change moments, right? I don't think that that moment changed her life, right? But this was part of the transformation that God is doing in me, about me, that then shows up in fruitfulness around the world, right? And that's encouraging, um, Lori Santos, in her stuff about kindness, one of the things that she mentions is um, about how performing acts of kindness makes us feel. And she said that the, the science shows that remarkably that when we do something kind for someone else, we feel better. Right? When we do something that's nice, whether we're saving someone's life or putting $5 in a donation bucket somewhere, that we get a happiness boost from that right, from doing acts of kindness. So essentially, the more kindness that we put out, the more happiness we have in our own lives, right, and the more compassionate the world is and all of those things, right, but, but it was, I mean, it was, it was interesting to me because, you know, we think often of doing these acts of kindness for other people, but actually, we are the ones that end up receiving so much of the benefit of the way that God works through us and sharing his love and showing his light um, to the world. I was thinking again of the story of David and Mephibosheth. And I wonder how they actually felt in those moments. You know, when David called him up and said, hey, I want you to come before me, right? What, what they were feeling I don't know if David got a happiness boost or not from that, right? But I was thinking about Mephibosheth and what would it have felt like when he was first injured. So like in a different part of the Bible, it tells the story of how that happened. He was a young boy and um, he was actually being carried by his nurse and she fell and broke his legs and they never healed properly. And so he was crippled from that. And, um, you know, I don't know what he felt like when he got that news, but I think that we all know what it feels like to get news. You know, I think we all know what it feels like to have the need for kindness in our lives. When we feel the weight of the hard things that show up in our lives. And I think that Mephibosheth had that. And I think we can all relate to that feeling and to recognize Right, that we were made to be connected to each other and to receive kindness from each other. Right, we were made to be on the receiving end of the kindness of God and of the kindness of each other. And then I think about David, and I don't know what he felt. The Bible doesn't say what he felt. Right, but he found himself in this position where he had enough. 
He had enough for himself, and he had enough to share. And I think we can all identify with that because we all have enough of something. We all have an abundance of something that we can give away. We all have a seat at our table that we could invite someone to. Some of us have an abundance of time where we could sit and we could learn someone's name and their story and remind them of their worthiness. Right, every one of us was made to not only receive kindness, but to offer kindness. And I think that we can recognize that in the story, right? But the thing is that there are sometimes things that trip us up from offering kindness. In her research, Lori Santos says that one of the things that prevents people from showing kindness is uncertainty, right? Like if you were in um, the airport and there was a terminal and there was a man sitting there and he was asleep at the gate and they were making a last call for the flight at the gate where he was sitting and asleep. Do you wake him up? Right? Like, do you, do you wake him up? Because you don't want him to miss his flight. If this is his flight, this guy needs to get on the airplane. This is like the last call. The door's about to close, right? But what if this isn't his flight? Like, what if he's sleeping there because there was space here and his flight isn't for a long time and he's not, right? So this uncertainty of not knowing if your act of kindness is going to result in gratitude or anger <laughs> makes us hold back, right? She says this is what, in part, what holds back good-intentioned people from kindness, and so I think she's right. Sometimes we don't do kind things because we don't know what the result will be. But I think there's another reason, too, that sometimes we don't do kind things. And it's because our instincts are not always right. Paul talks about this as well. He talks about um, human nature. In Galatians 5.17, this is right before the verse that we just read, um, he says that what the flesh desires is opposed to the spirit. And what the spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For those are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. Right? There are some things that we have a desire for that won't actually move us in the direction that we truly want to go. Right? There, there are times where we have to actually push against our instincts in order to be kind. Because there are ways that we are just wired to prioritize ourselves over helping other people. We, we have kind of a joke in our family that's developed a little bit of a joke where we, we talk about like the um, hashtag family first, right? Where that's like something that we're like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Like we feel really drawn to that, right? Where people will post pictures or something and they'll, they'll put the hashtag family first. And we're like, oh, that's really great. Except aren't we supposed to love our neighbors as we love ourselves? <laughs> so like I was like, oh, so it's developed this kind of just this ping for us where we're just kind of like, what is our instinct and what is it that we want to do? What is it that we naturally would gravitate towards in our lives or our, our instincts for ourselves versus what God is inviting us into? Um, Lori Santos talks about this too, and she talks about how there are things that we know will contribute to our happiness, um, but our instincts lead us in the opposite direction, right? Just the reality that our minds lie to us. Where, like, we, we know something. Like, she says, you know, we know, um, well, we have these, like, strong intuitions of what will bring us happiness, right? There's kind of these instincts where, where we think we just, we need to have more money, we need to have a change in our situation, we need, like, the newest iPhone, whatever it is, right? These things that are influenced by culture, that are influenced by whatever, but we just think those will contribute to our happiness. Even though science has said, and we know it's not true, there are these instincts that drive us and move us to actually act in ways that we move towards those, even though it's not the direction we want to go, right? And, and like if you had a long day and you were at work or you were at school or you were out running errands, like when you come home, like we know that science says that if you want to feel happier, if you want to feel better, you'll move your body, you'll go for a walk, or you'll pick up the phone and you'll connect with someone. Right? Science consistently tells us these are ways for us to feel better at the end of our day. But our instincts are to sit on the couch and watch TV. Right? We, we know this. And so we have to actually push against some of our instincts in order for us to move in the direction that we really do want to go. And this is what Paul is talking about. Right? The opposing things that war within us. And this is what a life of transformation is all about. Right? This is what we are invited to pushing away against the things that don't move us in the direction of the fruit of the Spirit 
and actually responding to God speaking and moving in our lives. Right? We were created to receive and to give kindness. Right? It is an attribute of God. It is something that we get to participate in. And, um, you know, it's, it's not that we're aiming for this constant goal of just always staying in a state of euphoria or happiness, right? That's not how God made us. That is not real life. But we are trying to recognize that in these moments, right, of doing kindness, of receiving kindness, of experiencing more happiness, that this can buoy us along and that this is the oxygen that gives us like the ability to keep doing the hard things that are put in front of us day after day. So this is what we get to do together. Um, and yeah, I think that this is part of what gives legs to this idea of life to the full, right? What does it mean for us to live life to the full and find a bit of happiness in our lives? So will you pray with me as we close? Lord, we thank you that you came to bring us life to the full. And God, we thank you for the extravagant kindness that you have shown and that you continue to show us. And Lord, now we just ask that you would continue your work in each of us. God, will you give us ears to hear what you're saying? Lord, will you help us to pay attention to the words and, of, and the leading of your Holy Spirit in us? so that we might see the fruit of your spirit develop more and more in our lives. Lord, help us to receive your kindness and help us, Lord, to give your kindness away. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, amen. Will you stand with me? Can we put our hands together for the word that the Lord gave Lindsay? Come on, it's been such a tough week. I know it's been a lot. We've all been going through a lot. We've all been thinking through a lot. It's would be ignorant of, of, of us to assume that when we come into this room that there's not things that we're considering, not things that we're talking about, t thinking through. So I wanted to take the opportunity to kind of just create an atmosphere of, of, of just relaxation, that there is a king who's seated among the throne and that's where our peace is found, on the throne of heaven. So no matter what you came in here, no matter what you're worried about, I know there's a lot of things going on in this world. I just encourage us to lift our eyes to him. Remember our God is on the throne. There's one king who's in control of everything. So I just ask if you would, cons if you would consider singing this with me. And I guarantee you as a body of Christ, we'd feel encouraged together. Come on, we're gonna sing there's a king. sing again. There is a king seated among us. Let every heart receive him now. Where there is praise, he will inhabit. And there will be grace in mercy all around. And every burden will be lifted in his presence. Every trophy will be laid down at his feet. There is a name that reigns above all others. Jesus Christ, the King above all kings. Come on, there's so much peace in that. He's the king above all kings. The maker of the heavens and the earth. We sing unto the Lamb. Unto the Lamb. Honor and glory. Worthy is he who overcame. 
buried in shame, risen in power, and he is alive, and the stone is rolled away, and all our worship will be Death is conquered, in our Savior holds the keys. There is a name, there reigns above all others. Jesus Christ, the King above all kings. Mercy flow down, Jesus. Oh, it won't be long. We will be holding, and every tear he'll wipe away. We'll be at home, the war will be over, and soon we will meet our Savior face to face. We sing every burden, and every burden will be lifted in His presence. Every trophy will be laid down at His feet. Thank you, Jesus. And all our worship will belong to you forever. Holy, holy, for all eternity. Yours is the name that reigns above all others. Jesus Christ, the King above all. Jesus Christ, the King above all kings. Jesus Christ, the King above all kings. Amen. Thanks for joining us in worship today. Uh, let us go out and show kindness to each other. Uh, I'd like to invite you to join us. Uh, in the crossroads space for coffee and donuts right now on the second floor. Uh, have a great week.